Today we're going to explore one aspect of the story of the Megillah we're going to read on Purim this week. I'll introduce it with a very uh, interesting story. The story they tell about somebody who's known as the Mittler Rebbe. The Mittler Rebbe, his name was Rabbi Doiv Ber, his last name was Shneuri. And he was a son of the Balatanya, Rabbi Shnei Zalman of Liadi, the founder of Chabad. And when his father passed away in 1812, the Mittler Rebbe, Reb Doiv Ber, succeeded his father as the second leader of the Chabad dynasty. The first Purim, Tovkuf Ayin Dalit, the first Purim, I'm seeing, I mean Tovkof Ayin Gimel, the first Purim after his father's passing, obviously he was in Shul listening to the Megillah. The custom then in the Shtetlach, and I think they still have it in some communities around the world, was that at the end of the reading of the Megillah, the congregants would leave a tip for the Balkaira. He would have a pushka, he would have a little box, and you would throw in a few ruble, a few kupkis, a small amount of money as appreciation to the Balkaira, to the one who read the Megillah, and this was part of their, you know, Purim income. The Mittal Rebbe goes out of Shul, and he puts into the pushke, he puts into the banks, a huge sum of money. One of the Hasidim was quite perplexed, and he says, Rebbe, why so much money as a tip to this Balkaira? So the Rebbe says, Azar Sheina Maisa. At the Tzelt, Azar Sheina Maisa. He just related such a beautiful story. What a thriller. What an extraordinary drama. Such a story deserves, deserves a lot of money. The man is now really perplexed. He says, Rebbe, I don't understand. You've been hearing the Megillah for many, many years. You've been hearing the story for many years. Why did it take you so much? Why did it overwhelm you so much this year? Now, you have to understand that each year, the minig of the Balatanya was that he would read the Megillah himself. He would also read the Torah himself on Shabbos. He was the Balkaira. So the Mittle Rebbe says, when the Tate had gelaint, is as given God anand maisa. When my father would read it, it was a very different story. So for the first time, he heard, so to speak, the story on a different level, on the very literal, on the very little real dimension, because the Megillah can be read on many levels. There's Pshat, there's Dremes, there's Drush, there's Sod, and all are true. And in the various commentators of Megillah Sester, you'll have different perspectives, the Ramah has a commentary on Megillah called Mechir Yayin, Rabbeinu Moshe Iserlish, and he writes, he brings from a Kabbalistic work called Mo'iri Oir by Reb Meir Papirish, who says that whenever it says Achashverish in the Megillah, it's referring to the Reboi Shalolam because Achashverish is a combination of three words, Acharis Vereshis Shaloi. The end and the beginning belong to him. The end of history and the beginning of history are all his so now you could read the whole Megillah, and any time you're talking about Achashverish, 
You're referring to Hashem, the truth is it says already in Gemara, Masech the Megillah, Balayla, who another Dashnas Hamelech, the Gemara, I think, uh, Megillah Dav Tesvav, Dav Tesvav, discusses Hamelech, Malka Shalalim, the king of the world. But today, I want to explore the Megillah not on that level, although we'll get to one aspect at the end, one Kabbalistic or uh, mystical aspect, but to explore one psychological theme in the Megillah. You could read the Megillah as a history book, and it's true. It's not only that. You can read the Megillah as a very deeply uh, religious and moral story, even though Hashem's name is not mentioned there. You could read the Megillah as a spiritual story. I want to read the Megillah today as a psychological story. <laughs> Let's see where that takes us. Esther is certainly the quintessential hero or hero, hero of the story of the Megillah to the extent that it's, it's, named, it's named for her. It's not named Megillas Mordechai ve Esther. It's not even named Megillas Esther or Mordechai. It has one name, Megillas Esther. And the Gemara Taka says in Masech the Megillah, Dav Zayin, Amir Aleph, that it was Esther, Esther who persuaded the Chazal, Esther who persuaded the members of the Sanhedrin, the Anshei Knesset Agdoila, to make Purim a holiday, and not only that, make the Megillah one of the Kisvei HaKodesh, Kosvuni Ledoides, the Gemara says, Esther sent a message, Kosvuni Ledoides, transcribe me for generations, and the sages were reluctant. The sages said, typical, classic Jewish response, it's going to generate anti-Semitism. <laughs> Kina atamati laleinu beinu umis, you're going to create jealousy, you're going to create hatred. Why would you want to transcribe such a story? Let's keep it, you know, let's keep it to ourselves. And what was Esther's response? Trust me, they know the story better than you. They know everything about the Jewish people. At least we should write it for ourselves. We should know who the Jew is. They already know who the Jew is. We should know who the Jew is. But that's a fascinating discussion in and of itself, how Esther managed to persuade Chazal. And so, it's called Megillah's Esther. She is the one, of course, under the leadership, instructions, indirect guidance of Mordechai. But it's she who implements the, the story, the salvation, the miracle, and the Yom Tev, and we'll soon see she actually disobeys Mordechai in one very significant moment. And we'll try to understand why. So it's her name, Megillah's Esther. But what we want to demonstrate today, Be'ezer Hashem, is that Esther wasn't just a righteous woman. Esther wasn't just a great uh, a hero of the Jewish people. Somebody was ready to sacrifice her life. All obvious themes in the Megillah. Esther was obviously also a tragic figure. Vatilokach Esther el Amelech, we celebrate Purim. Everybody was very happy, like Yehudim Moisoyer, but Esther had to remain in the palace. So there's an element of tragedy in Esther's life as well. Everyone went to feast and say Lechayim and Adel Yada, but Esther had to go back to uh, Achashverosh that night. We don't think of it in such terms. So Esther was also a very tragic figure, and she really gave her life for her people, and we're here because, we're here because of Esther. A beautiful word from the Malbim. I'll try to say it later about how he touches a word. Okay, we'll get to it. Bli Neder. You'll remind me. Now, that's one element. But I want to also show that Esther was maybe one of the greatest diplomats, recorded diplomats of history. Now, what's the definition of a diplomat? Diplomats don't get high rankings, usually in society. Because they're not seen as the most truthful or authentic people. But as the Gemara says in Masech the Nazir, or it's equal, sometimes an Avera Lishma for the sake of Hashem is better or equal to a mitzvah for ulterior motives. So I want to define diplomacy today as an introduction by a very uh, intriguing and humorous scenario that was presented by none other than a German Jew who's on El Tidei today. He celebrated last year his 90th birthday. His name is Henry Kissinger. 
Henry Kissinger was born in Germany, came to the United States. Whether you liked his diplomacy or were not in favor of it, a smart man he is. And Kissinger rose to become the Secretary of State of the United States of America. And thus had to become a great diplomat between America and the Soviet Union during the thickness, the thicket of the Cold War in his years, 1970 under, in the 70s under Nixon. A diplomat between America and China, etc. So they once asked... Kissinger, who had many years of experience in the White House, is the famous story you probably know, they say, it's a story or a joke that Golda Meir, when she became the Prime Minister of Israel, she wrote a letter to Henry Kissinger as the Secretary of State of America and said, you know, finally, we have a Jewish Secretary of State, we look forward to a close working relationship between Israel and the U.S. So Kissinger wrote back, according to this anecdote, I have to state to you, dear Mrs. Mayer, my priorities. Number one, I am an American citizen. I am not an Israeli citizen. Number two, I am Secretary of State of the U.S. I'm not Foreign Minister of Israel. Number three, I happen to be Jewish. And that is number three. So Golda Meir writes back, Mr. Kissinger, that's why I'm so looking forward to a close working relationship with you because you know, here in Israel, we read from right to left. <laughs> you're Jewish, you're Secretary of State, and you're also an American citizen. <laughs> she was also a kluge frey. She was quite a clever woman, Golda Meir. They once asked Henry Kissinger, my diplomacy, Zayn Masba, what's shot to be a diplomat? Those of you who are in positions of arbitrators, you have to make peace. Ben ish le ben ish ben business le business, those of you who Baruch Hashem HaZoyche to be members of boards and shuls and yeshivas and institutions, part of the job is arbitration. You know, you have to deal what, uh, what uh, Kerry called shuttle diplomacy. You have to shuttle diplomacy. What's the definition of, of, of a diplomat? So let me tell you what Kissinger said. He said it's very simple, okay? This is how it works. Let's say you need to accomplish a goal. And the goal is you want to marry off Rockefeller's daughter to a peasant from a Siberian village. How do you create the shidduch between Rockefeller's daughter and the peasant of some remote Siberian village frozen most of the year? What do you do? So the journalist who asked him the question says, that's impossible. It's not happening. How would you be able to do that? So Kissinger says, that's why you're not the diplomat. That's why I am the diplomat. He says, it's very simple. I travel to the Siberian village. I find a simple peasant. I ask him, would you like to marry an American lady? She says, why? Why would I go to America to marry an American lady? We have wonderful young women right here in my village. I say to him, yeah, you have wonderful ladies, but you have to understand this lady is a Rockefeller. She's Rockefeller's daughter. And Rockefeller is a billionaire. Ah, the villager, the peasant says, that changes everything. Of course, I would be happy to marry an American lady. Okay. From Siberia, I travel to Switzerland. In Switzerland, I go to the bank board meeting, and I say, would you like a Siberian peasant to be your bank president? I know you're looking for a president. I have a peasant from Siberia. They say, Mr. Sugar, you're insane? Of course not. I say, one second. He's not just a peasant from Siberia. He's Rockefeller's son-in-law. Ah, they say that changes everything. Gesundheit. Now I take a trip to the United States. I go into Rockefeller's office. I say, tell me, would you like your daughter to marry a Russian peasant? Rockefeller looks at me and says, Kissinger, you're out of your mind? You know who I am? I say, wait, wait one second, let me tell you who he is. He's the president of a Swiss bank. 
Rockefeller says, ah, that changes everything. Rockefeller calls over his daughter and says, Mr. Kissinger has f- found for you a chosen. Ah, he has found for you a groom, a fiancé, a president of a Swiss bank, somebody who is suitable mamish for you. He didn't use the word mamish, but somebody who's suitable for you. Congratulations. His daughter, a young, idealistic, spoiled, open-minded American girl, says, Pa! Never! Never! Why in the world would I marry a banker? They're arrogant, they're bratty, they're narcissistic, they're self-centered, all they know is money, money, money. I'm not interested in such a relationship based on money. I'm interested in a relationship based on simplicity, integrity, genuineness, simple humanity. I look at her and I say, but he's also a peasant from Siberia. She says, ah, that changes everything. Congratulations and the peasant from Siberia marries Rockefeller's daughter. This is how one... German Jew defined the definition of diplomacy. I want to show you <laughs> that many generations before Kissinger, and we're not going to say La Havdel on Jews, Esther employed this exact tactic, but far more brilliantly and with much more at stake in the Purim story. Let's begin with an obvious question that actually... A few years ago, we were sitting at the Purim meal and discussing the story of the Megillah. And I asked my kids, does anybody have any questions? Do you understand the story? And one of the boys asked this question, and it led me on a journey, a long journey, through many svarim. And the result of this journey, or at least one result of this journey, is the sheer here this morning. So I have to thank my son for asking the question. And he asked a very obvious question. The basics of the story everybody knows. Haman is the chief aide to the Persian king Ahasuerus. He influences the king to issue forth an edict to exterminate every Jew in the empire on one day, men, women, children. Eleven months before the day of implementation, the decree comes out the 13th of Nisan. The day of designation is 11 months later, the 13th of Adar. Mordechai, who is also an aide to the king and a member from the palace entourage, hears the news and he sends a message to Esther. What's the message? The message is simple. You're the first lady. You're the queen. You're a Jew. We know you're a Jew. It's time to act. If you look in source one, the Pasuk, the verse in the Megillah says it clearly. Perek Dalet, Pasuk Ches. Es Pashegen Ksav Ados Hashanitan Beshushan Lahashmidam Nosan Leilaharis Es Esther. Mordechai sends to Esther the document of the decree. He tells her, he commands her to do one thing. Come to the king and beg him. Beg him. That's all Mordechai says. Go into your husband. You have Paul. You have protectia. You're married to him officially. Go beg him. Plead with him for your nation. That's it, Mordechai asks her to do. As we'll see, she never does this. She never does what Mordechai told her. First, she argues about going into the king at all. She says, it's dangerous. You don't know my husband. (laughs) As I'm good to Meshugana. Or whatever the word she used. She said, I haven't been called in for 30 days. And if I come in and he doesn't stretch out his scepter, I come out with a head shorter. Achas dosoi lahamis. There's no games. It's not a vibrant democracy. Persia, Iran is still not a vibrant democracy, unfortunately. Not much has changed. Despots are despots. So, Mordechai, in his very famous statement 
im hacheresh tacharishi ba'esa zoy shevach v'atzol yamad leidem mokamach. If you remain silent, the Jews will be saved. But you will you lose the opportunity. Umi oideya im leis kazoy segat lamalchus. This is the reason you become a queen. Esther is persuaded by Mordech. And first she says they should fast for three days and three nights, and she will also fast. And then, And I will go into the king, uninvited, not according to the law. If I perish, I perish, the way Rashi explains it, etc. I mean, Rashi explains it a little differently, but Esther, regardless, Esther agrees to go. What happens now? What happens is, when Esther enters in Tachashverish's private chamber on the third day, by Hibayoy Mashlishi, the beginning of chapter 5 of Megillus Esther, what happens is, Achashverish stretches out, stretches out the golden scepter, and he asks Esther, what would you like? What is your request? We would expect, at that moment, perhaps, Esther would do what Mardukai told her to do plead with the king for her people. She doesn't do that. She has a different strategy. What's the strategy? Esther invites him for a feast. We have it in Perik Hei Pasa Gimel, your second source. What would you like? I'll give you everything till half the kingdom. Vatoimer Esther, which is a great offer, it's a great gesture. I'm ready to give you everything at Chatzia Malchus. You would think this is the moment. Esther would say, I'm just asking you for a little favor or a big favor. That's not what she does. Vatoimer Esther, Malamelech Toiv, Yovoi Hamelech, Vahoman Hayoim, Elamishta Sherasisila. If it's fine with the king, I ask the king and Haman to attend a feast that I have prepared for him. Who is him for the king for Achashverish? The king and Haman now attend a feast that Esther made. Now at the feast of wine where they're all drinking, he says, what would you like, Esther? Now we would think she made a feast Perhaps now, no. Sheilosi of Akashosi, Imatsasi Hembe, Neamelech, Vimalamelech Toy, Losses, Sheilosi Velasses, Bakashosi, Yovoi Hamelech, Vahomen, Alamishta, Shees, Elohem. I'm making a second feast, and I'm asking the king and Haman to come to the feast that I will make for them. For the king and for Haman, Umacher Esek at Varamelech, Vayet, say Haman, Bayoimahu, Sameach, Vatoy Vleif. Haman leaves the first feast. He's happy, he's joyous, he's on top of the world. Ah. Now, the question is simple. Why two feasts? Why two parties? Well, you can ask a bigger question. Why the need for a feast at all? Achashverish offered you to ask whatever you want at Chatzih HaMalchus. Stage your ca- plead your case. That's what Mordechai told you to do. Say I'm Jewish, I don't want to die, I don't want my people to die, as she will ultimately say at the second feast. She doesn't do that. She invites him to a party. But I think we can all appreciate, quite simply, the strategy. At a feast, at a party, everybody is more relaxed. It's more informal, especially if there's good wine, especially if your husband loves to drink. And a guy who threw a party for 187 days and liked the taste of alcohol and for whatever reason did not attend AA or any other 12-step meeting, Esther knew he's a guy you got to give to drink and to loosen up. Remember, she's standing and holding on to the scepter. It's tense. It's formal. It's well-structured. If you make one wrong move, you can die. The king is uptight. She's uptight. She was nervous. It was a dangerous situation. It's better not to talk. At a party, he'll be relaxed, he'll be at the end of a long day, he'll get a little tipsy, inebriated. I mean, she knew the guy. She knew him quite well. She probably knew him better than most others. So Esther understood, and we all know this, you know, you want to negotiate a very intense deal, you want to deal with a very problematic situation, we always bring food. Why do we always have food at every event? We can't even have a shear without food. 
Somebody once told me, said Rabbi Jacobson, never compete with a sandwich. If there's food coming out, don't think you'll be more powerful than that. But the Gemara says, G'dayla legima shemekarevis. G'dayla legima shemekarevis. You bring a legima, a in saraf, some wine, some mashka, some good wraps, especially if Esther brought it, I'm sure she brought in sushi to the party. If not, she couldn't get it from Japan, at least she brought Chinese food from China to the party. I mean, the Chinese were around. So, you know, Esther, Achashvesh eats, he drinks, it's geschmack. We get that. It's very normal. But I ask you now a question. He's there. He's in a good mood. He's drinking. And he says again, what do you want? I'll give it to you. At chatzia malchus. The Gemara says at chatzia malchus means till the base hamikdash. But she wasn't asking for the base hamikdash. But literally, at chatzia malchus, I'll give you anything. Almost anything. Go. Go for the punch. Go for the punch. No. What does she say? Let's make a second part. I now ask you from Esther's perspective, what did she think will happen at the second party that didn't happen at the first party? Well, we all know, between Perik Hay and Perik Zion, there's Perik Vov. <laughs> what happens is, after the first party, Hashverish goes home, and he can't sleep. For whatever reason, nobody gave him a sleeping pill. And even though the fact that he was quite drunk, he should have fallen asleep, the guy is suffering from insomnia. Okay. So he brings his diary, and they start reading different stories, and they read that Mordechai saved the king from an assassination years before. This didn't happen recently. Years before Bixen and Seders tried to poison the king, Mordechai was the one who gave the message and saved the king. So Ahasuerus decides he has to reward Mordechai. We all know that Haman comes in in the morning. He wants to have Mordechai executed, hung on a tree. Ahasuerus asks him, what do I do to the person whom I want to honor? Haman thinks, I'm certainly the person. He says, you dress him up in royal garments. You put him on the royal crown. You place him on the royal horse. You lead him through the streets of the capital, Shushan. And you have somebody announce, This is how we confer grace upon a man who the king wants to show honor towards. He tells Haman, do exactly that to Mordechai HaYehudi, Mordechai the Jew, and Haman does exactly that, and he leads Mordechai through the streets of Shushan. It's certainly a lovely, ironic story of poetic justice of Anapechu, but what happens after that is, Haman is now brought back to the second feast. Now, certainly... Esther, when she makes the first feast on a literal level, she doesn't know that her husband that night won't be able to sleep. From a level of pshat, Esther doesn't know what's going to happen in between the first feast and the second feast, where Mordechai will suddenly be highlighted and recognized, which would certainly help. So I ask you, why did Esther not bring up the issue at the first meal? Now let's say even you want to say that Esther didn't know what's going to happen through any, other, any method you want to explain. That is really not a critical part of the story, L'chayr. Because let's say Achashverosh would have had a good night's sleep. And Mardukai would have not been rewarded. The next day at the feast, when Esther would speak to Achashverosh, who says, I'll give you whatever you want, she, stood of, she stu- still could have staged that request. Now certainly, Mardukai could have been killed in the process, Khalil. So it was a great moment that Mardukai was saved, and not only he was saved, but Haman was humiliated. But my question is, from Esther's perspective, what was she thinking at that first feast to delay it for another day and make a second feast? Now it's interesting that in Torah, some of the greatest themes and ideas are conveyed and articulated through one word. And in this case, the answer to this question is conveyed in the Megillah through one word, or actually not even a word, through the change from one word to another word. I'm going to ask you to look again at source number two. Please note the change in Esther's words from invitation number one to invitation number two. Invitation number one, Pasuk Dalet, Perikei Pasuk Dalet, Imal HaMelech Toiv, Yavoy HaMelech V'Homon Hayoyim El HaMishta Asher Asisi Loi. Let the king and Homon come today 
to the feast that I made for him. Invitation to Pasuk Ches. At the first feast, the king says, what do you want? She says, Imal HaMelech Toiv. Yavoy HaMelech V'Homon El HaMishte Ashe'es Elohem. Let the king and Haman come to the feast I will make for them. What's the difference you see? Very good. Loi and Lohem. Both parties were for both. The first time she says, the party I make for him, for the king. The second time, it's a party I make for both of you, for them, for Achishverosh and Haman. Why the change? Why not the first time Lohem? Why not the second time Loi? This tiny little nuance in the Megillus Esther, captures the entire story. It tells you who Achashverosh was. It tells you who Haman was. Most importantly, it tells you how well, how well Esther played on the psychology of these two people in order to bring down one of the greatest salvations of the history of humanity and certainly the history of the Jewish people. Take a look at source number three. Chaim Shar Hapurim The Arizal has a sefer called Priyets Chaim. He goes through the Yamim Toivim. In the section of Purim, he says, and I quote, Yavoy Hamelech Vahoman Hayoim Roshatevis, Yud and He, and then Vav and then He. Yavoy Hamelech Vahoman Hayoim. It's quite perplexing and fascinating. Esther comes in and says, let the king and Haman come today. So the Arizal sees this as a reading of Shem Havaya, Hashem's name, and not only that, in the order. Very often you have words that the acronym makes up Hashem's name, Yud Hey, Hey Vav, Yud Vav, etc. But here you have it, Kisidra it's called, in the order, Yud, and then Hey, and then Vav, and then Hey. The key to understand Esther's strategy is to appreciate the personality of Achashverosh. Who was Achashverosh? Every leader has his vices and virtues, his talents and challenges, like every single one of us. And these vices and flaws display themselves in the leadership. Achashverosh, too, certainly had some great qualities. Chazal mentioned four of them but certainly had vices as well. And perhaps the best summary of Achashverosh's personality character, if you would take Achashverosh to therapy for nine years, and you would want the therapist or the psychiatrist or psychologist to ultimately give you the diagnosis of who this man is, so you have it in three words in Gemara. Mesechta Megillah Dav Tesvav Amit Beis, the fourth source, Rem Gamliel Oimer, Rem Gamliel says, Melech Hafchefechon Hoya. You know what Haf, <laughs> you know what Hafchefechon means? From which words? Hafuch. What does this mean? He's a king who we would say in English, he's spineless. He changes his position. Rashi says, Chayzebidiburoi. A word doesn't mean anything. Today he says this. Tomorrow he's pressured. He says something else. The next day he's afraid. He changes his position. He's a person who's constantly reinventing himself. Not because of spiritual or psychological growth. But simply because he's not sure who he is. And therefore he's not sure what position he can take. It's constantly changing. It's a very interesting description of a man. He doesn't say he's not honest. He doesn't say he's disingenuous. He doesn't say he's corrupt. He doesn't say he's a monster. He says, Melech haf chifechanoye. Edreitzich here and back and back in this. He lives in a world of complete insecurity and spinelessness and therefore is always afraid of his shadow and can never stick to something because there will always be somebody who disagrees with you as we know. What do they say? They say, Am I so about a rav? A yid came over to him and says, Yankul. Yankul stole from me a thousand dollars. The Rav says, the Bezgerecht, the Bezgerecht, get the money from Yankul. Yankul comes screaming and says, he's a liar, it's the opposite, he stole from me a thousand dollars. He says, David, the Bezgerecht, go take the money from Yankul. So the Rebetzin comes out and says, I don't understand. 
How can Yankel be gerecht and how can David be gerecht? How can they both be right? He says, du bist gerecht, euch. You're also right. They said about a certain Israeli politician that he was so um, ambivalent, he was so afraid to take a position that if they would ask him, do you like tea or coffee? He would say, half tea and half coffee. <laughs> somebody once said, just because... Somebody once said, just because I'm paranoid, it doesn't mean the whole world is not chasing me. <laughs> I'm paranoid, but the whole world is still chasing me. So this is Rem Gamliel's description of the king, the emissaries. There's a lovely description of Achashverosh in the Medrash. In Medrash Rabbah in Esther, it's called Psichta Tess, the ninth introduction to Medrash Rabbah Megillus Esther. He says, take a look at a person. First, he kills his wife because of his friend, and then he kills his friend because of his wife. His first wife he kills because of a friend, and then he kills, um, he, he kills his wife because of a friend, and he kills his friend, Memuch on Haman, because of his wife. And the Medrash, of course, is not discussing if it's right or wrong. Maybe it was right, maybe it was wrong. The point is, this is a Hashverish. There can't be loyalty, because for there to be loyalty, you have to have identity. <laughs> If you have no identity, how can you have loyalty? Which I think, on the most simple level, explains the very strange opening of the Megillah, which doesn't seem relevant. A man throws a party for 180 days. Who does that? It's worse than Woodstock. 180 days. True, he wants to show off his wealth. Bishnas asa mishtel He's done with 180 days of drinking and hulenzich. And now what happens? You would think he would want a break. No. Now, bimloyes hayam ha'ma'ela. Asa ha'ma'lech l'chol ha'om anemtsoyim b'shushan l'migodol v'atkoton mishte shiva asyama mechatsar ginas b'san ha'ma'lech. Now, every citizen of Shushan, from great to small, everybody, no exceptions, is invited to a feast. And then we have to hear exactly who the designer was, what the centerpieces were, what type of flowers there were, what type of goblets there were, what they served. I care if there was Chur, Kaipas, Tcheles, Chavle, Butzar, Gamon, Glile, Chesef, Amude, Sheish. Do we all have to emulate Bar Mitzvahs and weddings based on that? Seems like that's how some people understand the message of the Megillah. <laughs> we have to know. But then there's the key. Vahashsiyah chados ein oineis. What is a Cheshvedish trying to accomplish? He wants the love of the people. When you're insecure, all you crave for is validation. Love me. Compliment me. Tell me how good I am. Tell me how handsome I am. Tell me how perfect I am. Now, we all know it's nice to get compliments. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> you should give your loved one compliments. But for Achashverosh, it's desperation. Who doesn't like a compliment? I once gave somebody a compliment for something. He says, eh, Tafsish Zagi, you don't have to talk about it. I said, listen, from all the stories I know, I have never heard about a Din Torah, that somebody took somebody a Din Torah because he gave him a compliment. So even though everybody says, the Tafsish you don't need, a Din Torah you won't take me. Achashverosh, however, was desperate. And therefore he needed to gain and win the love and the affection of the people. He wanted to please everybody. It's not just about the party. It represents who the person was. And because this was the person, therefore he made sure that nobody should be unhappy because I want to be a king that everybody says nice things. This is an element of insecurity or paranoia. There was once a comedian who remarked and he said paranoia is a very bad personality trait for a comedian. Because as he gets up, he's thinking, what are you laughing at? So therefore, when somebody has to deal with these things, it's, 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 an, emotional, it's an emotional reality. There was once a woman who spoke about New York. So she said, you know, it, I really don't like living in New York. It's a terrible place to live. The only reason I have to live here is for health, for psychological and health reasons. Because I'm very paranoid, and New York is the only place where my, the only place where my fears are justified. <laughs> now, I think this explains why Achashverosh gets so upset when Vashti doesn't show up. He wants to display his power, his grandiose royalty... 
and he wants Vashti to show off her beauty as part of his, as part of his expression. Of course, Vatemoy and Amalka Vashti love Vashti refuses, and the king is burning mad. He's very, very angry. There's a quote by Emerson. He once said, Let me never fall into the vulgar mistake of dreaming that I am being persecuted whenever I am contradicted. Often, people cannot deal with being contradicted. They feel it's persecution. The Nitziv writes, What's Ezer Kenegdoi? Is she a helper or is she against him? And the Nitziv says sometimes, you help the person most by disagreeing with them. Ezer Kenegdoi. That's the function of a good Jewish wife. Now, this doesn't mean when you come home and somebody says, what did Rabbi Jacobson t- say today? He said that it's a mitzvah in the Ereisa, in Parshish Beresh, that you have to disagree with your husband. But what the Nitziv is saying very profoundly is that in life, when somebody disagrees with you, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Because it challenges you to expand your horizons, unless you're terribly insecure, and every contradiction is a declaration of war. And that's what happens in many homes. <laughs> and that's what happened in Achashverish's home. This wasn't just a small thing. For Achashverish, this undermined his confidence in a very deep, deep way. For him, it was a psychological death sentence. And we have to realize this, because when you're talking to somebody who's deeply shattered at their core, disagreeing with them or refusing them is often a psychological death sentence. And some people suffer from this throughout their whole life. Not only that, the Gemara says in Masech the Megillah that when the king ordered his wife to come, what was the message she sent back? The message she sent back was he should remember his humble origins as the man who guarded the horse stable of her father, Belshazzar. Remember, Vashti was a daughter of Belshazzar, the Babylonian emperor, who was a son of Evil Meroidach, who was the son of Nebuchadnezzar who was the great Babylonian monarch who destroyed the first base Hamikdash? So Vashti was a great granddaughter of Nebuchadnezzar and therefore of real royal Babylonian blood. And you began as a, gal, as a shamish in this horse of my horse stable of my father. Remember who you are. The Vilna Gaon has a brilliant commentary in the first period of the Megillah where the Posse keeps on changing from Hamalka Vashti to Vashti Hamalka. But Tamoyan Hamalka Vashti. And then Achashver says Vashti Hamalka. He says that was the arguing. Does she begin as a queen and then she's Vashti? Or Achashvedi says, no, you're just Vashti. I turned you into a queen. This was the argument the Vilna Gaon points out in the Pesukim. You'll see Amalka Vashti, Vashti Amalka. And he shows it even in the trop. The trop, every time it says Amalka Vashti or Vashti Amalka, is representing this argument. Vashti says, who do you think you are? And Achashvedi, who knows that Vashti has a good point, which is usually why husbands get so infuriated, because it's not that their wives are wrong, it's that their wives are usually right. Am I right or am I wrong about that? Okay, they're all nodding, they're all nodding, fine. So, uh, <laughs> next week I might have more women than men if I continue this way, right? So, so of course, Achashverosh is completely, is completely infuriated. And, and therefore, therefore... Vashti is now a great threat to Achashverosh. On the other hand, the king doesn't just execute Vashti. He consults all of his yodiyat and all of his experts. And the Gemara says, Chazal say in Megillah, and the Medrash says that Achashverosh was hesitant to kill her. Of course, he's a half <laughs> He He's very angry, but he can't really take a position to kill her. He's insecure. He's paranoid. Who gets up and says, we have to kill him? Mamuchan gets up, and how does he explain and justify the murder, the, the, the execution of Ashti, how does he justify it? He says, It's not just a personal thing. She's going to create a revolution. She is absolutely, there's going to be chaos in this place. And nobody will ever forgive you for allowing this woman to create a revolution where peep men become shmatas, under they become doormats for their wives. So wow, now Achashverosh is like, oh no. So now this whole thing is going to turn into a revolution. I just spent 187 days trying to make all my chevre like me, and Mamuchan is telling me they're going to hate me. This is Achashverosh. Now let's get to Haman's 
Let's put Haman on the couch for a few minutes. Haman is no foolish guy. We know, first of all, he knows about Judaism better than some Jews. <laughs> That's number one. Number two, he has some spiritual sensitivities with his goyrolas. Number three, the man is clever, but equal to his cleverness, he has an ego from Hoidu Viat Kush. He has an ego that's quite large. How do I know he has an ego? It's very simple. If everyone is bowing down to me, the whole world, and then there's one old Jew who's sitting with Mesech Tzvachim, or Mesech Tzuvis, I should say, and he's learning, and I walk by and he doesn't bow down to me, and I go crazy. It destroys my day, it destroys my night. You're having issues, Rabbi Isai. This man is having issues. This is how the Bali Musa explained the Gemara in Chul. The Gemara in Chul and says, Haman mina Torah minayin. What's the source of Haman in Torah? So the Gemara answers, Hamina eats. Asher tzivi sicha lebilti echol meno achalta. Hamina eats from the tree that I told you not to eat. You ate. So Rashi says, Hamina eats that Haman was ultimately hung on the tree that he prepared for Mardukh. But it is strange. What's the connection of Hamina eats? The eats hadas, the tree, to Haman mina Torah minayin. Generally, what's the question? Haman min atayra min atayra. Haman, who cares what Haman is min atayra? Famous word of the Chazaynish. The Chazaynish says that the reason Mordechai didn't bow down to Haman, the Gemara says in Megillah, is because Haman turned himself into an idol. If he turned himself into an idol, so therefore you can't bow down to him. It's not just bowing down to a person. It's bowing down to a, a deity, a pagan god. So the question is, how could we mention the name of Haman? V'shem alakim acherim lo yisham al pichin ala to mention the name of an avodizara. The Gemara says in Sanhedrin, Samachimah, one of the Amirayim said a name of a desert. They said, how could you mention it? He said, it says in Torah. So the Gemara says, Homa min Torah min Ayin. Where does Homa say in Torah? So that when we say his name, Amin Eitz Hazah. So the Bali Musa give their own perspective. The Bali Musa say, where does a person become so arrogant? How does a person become such a narcissist? That everyone bows down to you. One man doesn't bow down to you and your day is ruined. And the answer is, Amin Eitz Hazah. Lahavdil, Adam and Chava were told by God that they can eat from every single tree in the garden. There's only one tree off limits. And they say to themselves, we have to eat that tree too. Haman min minayin. What's the origin of this psychological makeup? It begins on a much higher level with two people created by Hashem. He says, the whole world is yours. One tree is off limits. I can't deal with that. I need that tree too. And you have this psychologically with people. There was once a Yid who came to the Helik at Samach Tzedek and he said, Ali in Shul mir. Everyone in Shul steps on me. He says, Du spreitst sich ois umetum, vumetret is es avdir. Your problem is you spread yourself around everywhere. So wherever anybody steps, it's on you. You know, sometimes people walk into a place, there's a conversation between two people, and what are you thinking? They're talking about me. They're always talking, you're everywhere. So wherever anybody steps, it's on you. Because when you don't have, when you don't have, when, when, when you don't have a place where you feel solid, then you have to be everywhere. <laughs> if you're not any, everywhere, you're nowhere. So Haman has this component, and therefore he cannot deal with Mordechai not bowing down to him. That's number one. But Haman's ego now takes advantage of Achashverosh in a very interesting way. When you have a leader who's insecure, and because he's insecure, he's paranoid. So a paranoid leader can easily fall prey to a person who feeds his paranoia. If this person can only present himself as the ultimate protector of this leader, the leader will allow this person to do almost anything because he becomes so dependent on this person. Without him, he feels unsafe. Without him, he feels unstable and insecure. And therefore, Haman, in his cleverness, used Achashverosh's weakness to ultimately dominate the empire. The Gemara says in Megillah, who was Memuchan, who had Achashverosh kill Vashti? It was Haman. Why would Haman want to kill Vashti? Vashti ultimately limited Haman. She was his last obstacle to power because she didn't allow him to completely rule. She was not one of his subjects. As a result of inculcating fear in the king from Vashti, that Vashti's existence will undermine his entire empire, Haman now realizes that he is now free, 
There's only one man on the top, a chashverish. He has a chashverish in his palm by feeding his paranoia, and he is good to go. When Vashti is gone, the last person with power is now off the stage. The opportunity is now open for Haman to yield limitless power over the king and his enormous empire. Where do we see this? We see it again in Pshat, the way the Megillah is written. If you look in your next source, source number 5, the beginning of Esther Peri Gimel, Achar Hadvarim Ha'ele Gidal HaMelech HaChashverosh Es Haman Ben Amdosa HaGogi Vayinaseyu Vayosim Eskisim Alkal HaSodom HaSharita After these events, the king raised Haman and made him his top eight. After which events? After which events? The end of Perik Bezes, two fellows, Bixen and Seresh, attempted to assassinate Achashverosh. What's the next scene? After these events, Haman becomes the most important aid to the king. What's the connection? The connection is very simple. Haman comes into Achashverosh and he says, look, everybody wants to kill you. Everybody wants to kill you. Bixen and Seresh are two bodyguards. They were poisoning your food. And Haman cleverly feeds this to an insecure, paranoid king on a good day. You have a major empire. Everyone wants to kill you. So what happens now? Achashverosh is so paranoid, he desperately needs Haman. Because Haman is the man who feeds him the paranoia and then is the one who guarantees safety and protection. And creating a situation where nobody will be able to touch the king. So of course he raises Haman to be the greatest person. So Haman's ego is now fed by feeding Achashverosh's paranoia. And all seems to be very powerful. And if you're doubting how accurate this description of Achashverosh and Haman is, I once heard in a tape of Shir from Rabbi Yosheber Soloveitchik, he said in our generation, we sadly had a very accurate description of this. Two people. There was Joseph Stalin, and there was Lavrenti Beria. Stalin was the leader of the Soviet Union from 1924 when Lenin died, till March 1933 when Stalin died on Purim. Purim 19... Not 1933, 1953. Tavshin Yud Gimel. On Purim, or the week of Purim, Stalin died. For 30 years, the Soviet Union became a hell on earth. Stalin killed between 30 and 50 million people. More than Hitler. His own people. Between 30 and 50 million. We don't even understand what those numbers are mean? You ever saw 30 million people? You ever saw 1 million people? You ever saw 600,000 people? It's a special blessing for 600,000 people. This was Stalin. Between his executions, his mass purgings, his gulags, it was, it was an extraordinary, horrific era in history. And truth be told, even many Jews, although Jews suffer terribly under the communists, and many Jews were communists, are not so familiar with that chapter because the Holocaust eclipsed the horrors of Stalin, who fought Hitler, but the horrors of Stalin were akin. He was, he was not just a tyrant, he was a tyrant of, of, of proportions, of historic proportions beyond people's imaginations. Stalin was a very paranoid man. It's well known that he purged and he killed his closest aides constantly. Everybody was suspected of any level of disloyalty was immediately shot. No question. My father, Olav Shalom, was a journalist for many years. Stalin's daughter, Svatlina, defected from the Soviet Union and came here. My father interviewed her. My father grew up in Russia and suffered a lot. His father was almost executed by the communists and then he was exiled for 25 years until he got out in the middle of the war. So, uh, so my father interviewed Stalin's daughter. I heard this from him. And Stalin's daughter told, so he asked Stalin, he asked Stalin's daughter, Svetlina was her name, I think, Svetlina, yeah? What, tell me about a morning with your father. Tell me about a breakfast with your father. And she said my father would sit, she described to my father what he would eat for breakfast. And he was always writing up a list, a list. And she would look, it was a list of names, names. And within 24 hours, all those people were shot. This was Stalin. Who was Stalin's most trusted person? One man, the head of the KGB. His name was Beria. When Stalin died in 1953, the next leader of Russia was Khrushchev. 
Khrushchev, in his memoirs, wrote about Beria and he said that Stalin trusted absolutely nobody. But he said there was one person whom Stalin allowed to offer his frank advice in foreign policy matters. He trusted him. This was Beria. Beria shared the same Georgian roots as Stalin. He had a reputation of endless loyalty to him. But in truth, it was all a completely cynical power play. Because Beria knew that Stalin was such a paranoid man, he fed it all of the time, so he made Stalin completely dependent on him. And that was his brilliance. Stalin knew without Beria, he'll die any minute. This one will kill him, that one will kill him. There's a popular story, understand Beria, and then you'll understand Haman. In the early days of their relationship, Beria saved Stalin for an, from an assassination attempt. But you know who staged the assassination attempt? Beria. <laughs> that was Beria. He made the assassination attempt, and he saved him. And when Stalin realized that, <laughs> this was his man. Beria was ruthless, ruthless. And uh, for 30 years, for 30 years, tens of millions of people died. This was Haman. So Bixen and Seresh staged the assassination. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm going to tell you now that Haman influenced Bixen and Seresh to do it like Beria with Stalin. Although maybe. Maybe we'll find a Medrash one day, but I don't know that. But the clear, one thing is clear. After this, Achashverish put Haman in power because he realized without Haman he's not safe. And this explains why Esther says, if I come in, without being invited, and he doesn't stretch out his scepter, I'm dead. Why? You're his queen. <laughs> Why are you dead? Why if you walk into his chamber, do you die automatically? You didn't do anything. You just walked in. You didn't come in with a stick. You didn't come in with a gun. You didn't come in with a spear. You didn't come in with a sword. But Haman created around the king such security that was unimaginable that even his own queen can't come in without permission because we understand what type of atmosphere Haman created in the palace. There was absolute mistrust from your own spouse and therefore nobody can get close to Achashverosh and this worked for Achashverosh, this worked for Haman, which also explains on a literal level how Haman can persuade Achashverosh to exterminate the Jewish people. What are his words to Achashverosh? He says you have one nation, they're scattered all over the place, they have a different religion. They don't follow the laws of the king. In other words, in other words, you have a fifth column. You have here a potential revolution in the making. You have here the greatest rebels against the king's authority. And they're all over the place. So therefore, they have this social media that goes on between them. And if basically they decide to stage a revolution, you know what happens. They're organized. It's Amechad. It's one nation. It's not just a few rebels and therefore you can cut it down. It's all over your empire, all over 127 of your provinces. And therefore, you're dealing with a very dangerous situation. And in fact, in fact, that's exactly what happened with Stalin. In 1953, Stalin had the famous, you're familiar, famous doctor's trial. He decided that the Jewish doctors, this month, yeah, this month, March, he decided that the Jewish doctors have this major plot to assassinate not only him, but all the top, top uh, representatives of the communist regime. Thank God Stalin died. <laughs> Stalin died before it was implemented. But it was a whole plan. A whole, people say it was a plan to kill, to exile the Jews, Biribijan or other places. In any case, Haman has the ears of Achashverosh, when he shows him how horrible the threat is, and an insecure, paranoid man certainly falls prey even to situations that don't warrant such, such caution. Now that we have this in place, let's now meet Esther. Esther is a tzaddikis, Esther is a great woman, but Esther is also a great strategist great psychologist, and a great diplomat. Esther understands something that many people don't understand about paranoid and insecure people. And that is, they don't have the confidence and the strength to really listen to you or to give in to your requests because they're always trying to hold on to themselves. They're always trying to protect their throne. They're always trying to protect their identity. 
That's why for a relationship, insecurity and self-denigration is sometimes the worst thing for a relationship. Because you can never give space to the other person, not because you're bad, not because you're bad, not even because you're narcissistic. Your narcissism comes from your complete insecurity. Because you completely don't believe in yourself, you always have to hold on to yourself. You could never give space for another person. Esther understood one thing about her husband. And that is, I'm dealing with a paranoid man and I'm also dealing with a paranoid tyrant. (laughs) You can have a paranoid man, you have a paranoid tyrant. Who knows a husband's insecurities better than a wife? To shul, the husband comes up dressed nicely with a tie, with a suit. He runs the kiddush, he's a member of the board, he's the chazan, he's the baltfila. He comes home, salam de maisa. Right, they say there was a chazan in Rosh in New Jersey. And after the Rosh the Tvila, the president came over to him and said, you were horrible and we're never ever going to hire you again. He comes home and he says he doesn't, can't make kiddush. His wife says, why? He says, I fast in Rosh Hashanah. She says, you fast? I know you for 40 years. You don't stop eating. So uh, he says, okay, I can't make Kiddush because I'm not in the mood. She says, what's the problem? He says, I just finished the Tfilis. President of the Shul came over to me and he says, never again. You're the worst chazan in the history of civilization. We're never hiring you again. So his wife was an Isha Tzitkanis. She knew what's the right thing to tell to her husband when he's down and dejected. She says, eh, that stupid president. You think he knows everything? He just repeats what the Shul tells him. Who, who, know, who knows a husband as well, who, as well as her wife? His, wife? his wife. Here is where Esther disagrees. Mordechai says, go into Ahasuerus and beg him. Say, save me. I'm your husband, my people. Esther will not do that. You know why she won't do it. She won't do it for a simple reason. Because she knows that for Ahasuerus there's nothing more important than ensuring his own authority, his own security. He was unreasonably suspicious of one and all. He was driven by one motif overall, the fear of his losing power. Esther understood sociopathically he would be indifferent to any other concerns. If Haman was right and the Jews are a threat, nothing would stop him with proceeding. Nothing would stop him from proceeding with this plan of total annihilation of his perceived enemies, for such is the nature of paranoia. So what happens now if Esther comes in and she says, it's me, I'm Jewish, it's my people. We're being annihilated. Even by the first feast. What happens? Achashvedish is not in a position where he's rational, sober, wholesome, powerful, secure. Achashverosh is living in this delusional bubble that Haman so cleverly created after Bixon's and Seresh's death, already from Vashti's death, which happened nine years ago. And the security is so tight. Oh, wow, my own wife is trying to kill me. My own wife is a Jew who's trying to kill me. And Vashti, Esther herself could be killed. And I'm going to go back to the same, same man, Stalin. Stalin had a son, Jacob who was captured by the Germans in World War II. The Russians had a field marshal, a Nazi, a German field marshal. They told Stalin, we'll exchange, we'll exchange your son for the German field marshal. Give us back the German field marshal, we'll give you Jacob Stalin. Stalin said, no, I don't exchange field marshals with lieutenants. Of course, he told his close people, my son is a spy. Why was he captured by the Germans? He's a spy for the Germans. I'm not going to let him go. So of course he died. He had Herod. Herod, Hordus. You know the story with Hordus? He killed his kids. He killed his family. He killed his loved ones. Augustus said, the Caesar of Romans said, it's better to be Herod's dog than to be his child. Hordus treated his dogs with dignity, not his children. He had Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great. I mean, despots throughout history, their own children they murdered. Why? Because they were, they were smart people and they were powerful people. But psychologically, they lived in such fear and paranoia. They're not rational. Esther could be rational. It's not going to work. So what do you do? I could beg and plead with somebody who operates on a level of logic, rationality, 
I hope to appeal to your seichel, to your kinder sentiments. But what if somebody is too meshuga to be compassionate? So it would be pointless, and if Esther tried too hard to change the decision or question it, she can get killed as well. She would become the next enemy of the state, and when she's the enemy of the state, the situation is doomed. So that's why Esther does not do what Mordechai tells her to do. What does she do? She does something else. What would you do now? <laughs> You're standing in front of a situation, and it's an impossible situation. Haman un- is yielding limitless power. Achashverosh is the boss. He likes you personally, but he doesn't know you're Jewish. The security level, the insecurity and paranoia has reached all heights. When you look at it from every angle, your mission is doomed. This was Esther's situation. Every angle, Bederich HaTeva, there's nothing to do. What is she supposed to do? Speak to him, won't work. Plead, probably won't work. Beg and try to put pressure. <laughs> She'll become the enemy. Vas Tutman, what do you do? So you have to bring together Rockefeller's daughter with a Siberian peasant. Siberian peasant, but there's one difference. A whole nation is at stake. It's not just a shidduch. The Am Hashem, Klal Yisrael's future destiny is at stake. What do you do? So Esther, Esther, the Eze Kenegdai, she understood Achashverosh was a talented man in many ways, but he had one weakness, Hafach Fachon, insecure, paranoid. Haman was a clever man, a capable fellow, but he also had one weakness. His ego was very, very large. Esther played one weakness against another weakness. And when the two weaknesses were played against each other, she found a solution to her dilemma. What Esther understands is there's only one way out of this mess. She has to turn around the tables on Haman and she has to show Achashverosh that if there's somebody to be paranoid about, if there's somebody to be afraid of, you know who it has to be? It has to be Haman. He is your arch enemy. He is the man you got to be scared of. She can't over, she can't ignore his paranoia. She can't go around it. That's him. She has to feed it like Haman. But how? She has to show, ha ha, you're afraid? Yeah, you know who she should be afraid of? She should be afraid of this man. In fact, many historians argue, who poisoned Stalin? (laughs) Beria. Still not known for sure. Why? Because he realized he's about to assassinate him. He realized that Stalin is learning that Beria is not the loyal, the loyal fan that he thought he was. And now he was the next on the list. So he managed to get rid of Achashverosh first. He managed to get rid of Stalin first on Purim. Esther understood. She has to show Achashverosh. He is the man you should be paranoid of. How do you do that? You walk in and you say, Haman is not your friend. Oh, you're my new enemy. A new Bixen Viserish, a new Vashti. I already have experience with Vashti who tried to undermine me. Now you're going to undermine Haman. Ah, this is what Esther now does. She comes into her husband, says, Buzzville's to Esther, to ask for her people now. You've got to be crazy. She says, the first thing is, Yavoy HaMelech V'Haman HaYoyim Al HaMishta Sisi Loi. Come to a party that I made for the king. Achashverosh must be thinking, why is Haman coming to a party? Imagine you go over to your wife after the shear, and you say in honor of our 15th, 20th anniversary, let's go out to eat, but let's bring also Pliny Ben Pliny to the restaurant. Whoa, 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 wait. Well, say, you ask your husband out to a party, hate. why is somebody else coming? And it's not a, a brother, a sister, a sister... Why is Haman coming? So Achashverosh must be thinking. What's the logic? You asked your husband to celebrate with you. Beautiful. It's going to be a romantic, fun, joyous occasion. They'll be drinking. And we know Achashverosh was taken by one thing, as Chazal say. And Esther would feed that. Why is Haman coming? So Achashverosh must think, you know, 
Haman is, is the best friend. He's our best friend. You know, he's the closest person in the, to me. He's my closest aide. He leads the palace. He's the most important minister. I told everybody to bow down to him. So I guess it's a friendship type of a feast. Me, Esther, and Haman. It's a little strange, but okay. Haman is coming. But I, Esther worded it very well. Yavoy HaMelech v'Haman hayoy malamishta sisi loy. It's a feast for the king. Me and Haman are coming. I'm making the feast. It's for the king. And Haman is an invited guest. Beautiful. They come to the party. Mizitzt. Esther was brilliant. When Haman leaves the party, what does it say for the first time in the Megillah? Sameach v'toiv leiv. The Malbim writes, at that point, till that point, he was never besimcha. He was always angry. Because when you have an ego from here to China, how could you be happy? You know people with big egos? People who are completely insecure. People who have monsters ego could never be happy. Nothing is ever enough. Nothing is ever good. No, everybody wants to try to kill me. And you need more and more and more and more. Hamin ha'eitz hazeh. The last tree has to be mine. Tolstoy has a story. Extraordinary story. He was a famous Russian writer. He has a story about this man who craved more and more and more. And there was a Russian peasant who owned enormous quantities of, 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 of land, forest in Russia. You know, Russia is, 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 is huge. It never ends. It's the largest country in the world. And he had enormous quantities of land, and he gave an offer. And the offer was, you come to my estate, and every part of land that you cover from the morning till the evening... You start walking on my land, 6 o'clock a.m., and any piece of land you walk on becomes yours. Imagine somebody would offer you that any piece of land of Manhattan that you walk on today becomes yours. Not too many of you would be sitting here at the Shear, because <laughs> you walk on Madison Avenue, you walk on Fifth Avenue, you walk even on First Avenue. It's not a bad deal. So this fellow who is craving money and power goes... Say, what's the deal? And the peasant says, it's simple. 6 o'clock a.m. you start walking. You have to be back here at 6 o'clock p.m., the same place where you started. And any land that you covered is automatically yours. All you have to give me is one ruble. Unheard of deal. Unbelievable. He starts walking. It's Gavaldik, another foot, another yard. More and more and more, a half a mile, a mile, two miles, mighty dick. But then he thinks to himself, why am I so stupid? Why am I walking? Why am I not running? I can have so much more. And he starts running and running and running. And now he covered 10 miles and 20 miles. He's now doing a marathon. The problem was he wasn't that in shape. He was somewhat obese. He wasn't a fellow who exercised every day for three, four hours, and it was getting to him. But the taiva, the craving for more land was so enticing, he didn't stop running. But at some point, after a few hours, he started to collapse. And he got up, and he ran again, and he collapsed, and he got up and ran again. And he ran and ran, and he covered Moirevira Boisai. The man covered dozens and dozens and dozens of miles. Moiradik. And he sees, he sees his new estate. But then he realizes, oy vey, I have to get back. You got to get back by 6 p.m. What do I do? <laughs> so he gets up and he starts running all the way back. But now he doesn't have koiches anymore. He's gone. He's depleted. He runs and runs and he collapses and gets up and collapses. He feels that his heart is failing him. His body is failing him. But there's no choice. He's not going to forfeit this opportunity. And he comes back. And it's 5.59 p.m. And he sees, ot, 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 he sees his Mashiach, he sees his destination. Falls down, but his last koiches gets up. He's now barely breathing. Reaches the destination at 6 o'clock sharp. But from the loss of koiches, he just falls down. And he falls down. And as he's on the ground, he stretches out his arm, covers another piece of land, says, this too is mine. And those were his dying words. And the end of the story, they dig a grave for him. The grave is six feet 
by two feet. And he says, that is all the land the man needed. Six by two. And it's, of course, the title is, how much land does a man need? The, type, the, the, the message, of course, is, a person with such an ego can be happy. Haman. Esther understands this. What does she do at the first feast? Haman suddenly, now for the first time, feels he has the world. Why? Because Esther made sure to make Haman feel priceless. What does he come home? What's his first words to Zeresh? Look at me. Look where I have reached today. I have everybody in my Keshina. The king I knew I had. But I even have this queen. And he knew that Esther wasn't a Catholic Hanya. I even have her. She's also sold on me. This is exactly what Esther needed. During that feast, she treated Haman with so much respect and so much dignity and so much affection. Now Ahasuerus became completely uncomfortable. And then she delivers the punch. Ahasuerus turns to her and says, Esther, what do you want? So she changes one word. What does she say? I want you to come to the feast that I made for both of you. Now, paranoid people hear everything. You know that, right? You know when you're walking in a dark alley, 3 o'clock in the morning, every leaf that moves, you're calling the police, right? You hear a movement, it's a frog trying to do tikkun chatzois, and you call the chavr kadisha. You call Atzali, you call Mesaskim, you call Chaveinim, you call Shoimrim, you call Shmira. And then you realize it's a frog. Or worse, a little wind came and the... Why? Because when you're petrified, you're terrified, you hear everything. Achashverish heard everything. That's what paranoid people do. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> That's why, if you have a relationship with somebody insecure and paranoid, they remember what you said 39 years ago. And it's still bothering them. And it comes out four decades later. Hopefully only one decade later. If you're lucky, it comes out a few hours later. And then they can get rid of it. Achashverish is like, whoa. Yesterday it was a party for me. Today, it's a party for us. Ah, Haman is an ayam echitten. What a Freudian slip of Esther. She's now throwing parties for us. First of all, why is Haman coming back? You had an evening with your husband and the top secretary of state. Got it. Now maybe a little privacy, a little... No, Haman is coming back. Not only is he coming back, he's an equal. He's lahem. And suddenly, Achashverish goes back and his mind is racing. All the fuses in his brain, you could see it on him. All the fuses in his brain have been lit up and he's asking himself, what's going on here? Esther and Haman have a private relationship. Does Haman have a crush on Esther? Does Esther have a crush on Haman? Does Esther love him? Why is she inviting him to every meal? Mela the first meal, why the second meal? Are they being intimate with each other? Is there betrayal here? Is there treason here? Or maybe, or maybe, Haman is manipulating her and he wants to get rid of her like he got rid of Vashti. Maybe that's the situation. Maybe Haman somehow got to her She's inviting Haman, he's manipulating her, he's just thinking, he doesn't know, he doesn't know. Of course, Haman wasn't trying to kill Esther, but he doesn't know. Or maybe the great paranoid fellow says, maybe something else is going on. Maybe Esther and Haman are in cahoots, and they're going to kill me. Maybe I'm in danger. I don't know, but I know something schmecked. That's it I know, so schmecked. That's it Esther wanted to accomplish. She didn't want to feed a particular message. She wanted to get this paranoid tyrant feeling that something is off and I got to be very conscious and very sensitive. What's the next moment? That night, the king can't sleep. Literally, it's not a miracle. It's, it's, it's the very, it, well, it was a, the whole thing was a miracle. But we understand what's going on psychologically. Of course he couldn't sleep. Would you be able to sleep? 
your own wife, and your top eight, your own spouse, your own barrier, are here doing things. You're in the dark. Lo Elohim, this poor guy was sleepless. He couldn't deal with it. Now, I just tried to give context. But every word I said in this shear, I think, is intimated in two lines in Gemara. But when you have the context, you can appreciate the words of Rava. Take a look, the next source, Megillah, Dav Tesvav Amit Beis. Ksiv Balayla, Hu, Nadad Shnas HaMelech. Rava Omar, Shnas HaMelech HaChashverish. He couldn't sleep. Mamish, the king, not the king in heaven, the king on earth. Nafla Le Mil He started to think. Omar, he said, Mai De Kamon, there's a min say Esther Lo Haman. Why did Esther invite Haman? And of course, this is already after the second invitation. Dilma Eitzi Koshokli Iluye Da'u Gavre Le Maybe they're planning to kill Hahu Gavre, meaning himself. Maybe they want to kill me. Hader Omar. Now look at Rav's description of this guy. Tell me who Rav thinks he is. Hader Omar. Then he says, Ihachi Lo Yav Gavre De Rachim Li Da'u Mudali. One second. There's no friend in the whole Persian Empire that would tell me? Hadar Omar. <laughs> then he says, Maybe there's somebody who's a friend. He did me a favor in the past. I never paid him back. So he's not going to do me a second favor. That's why people are not telling me that they want to kill me. You know why? Because they see they're not getting favors in return. Right away he says, let me see if there's anybody I ever did a favor to and I didn't reward them. Look at this poor man's mindset. He's lying in bed at Shlofnisht. Shlofnisht. He switches channels, channel to channel to channel to channel. Nothing working. So he takes his iPhone. He goes from website to website to website to website. Finishes reading all the news. Then he goes through the comments. I don't have to tell you. He goes through all the comments. It's four o'clock in the morning. Eshlafnisht. He even comments himself. Anonymous, anonymous. <laughs> he makes machos. He puts people in cheirim. He explains that it's kfira. It's all Lashon Hara. That's why he's on the site for a whole night. Because it's Lashon Hara. It's Senera. So what does he start thinking? They want to kill me. Who? Of course, my wife. And Haman. Then he says, no, but I have a best friend. Then he says, but maybe my best friend is not my best friend anymore. You see? You see how the mind works? These are the thoughts Rav is putting in Tachashverish's mind. Where did Rav get these thoughts from? This is the pattern of thought. Now we all have these thoughts. Most of us, however, are not in the position of Tachashverish. So therefore, these thoughts don't have such an impact on a conspicuous level on society. Even though on an unconscious level, all thoughts have an impact. But this is what Rav is doing. Who staged all of this? Esther. How did she do it? One word. Loi. Wahem. She elevated Haman. And now she's feeding the paranoia of Achashverosh. How? By showing him Haman may be the worst enemy. But she does one more thing. Haman is clever. But he has one weakness. His ego. She's feeding his ego. And bringing him to a place where he doesn't realize that he's digging his own hole. What do they say about life? The only job that you start on the top is when you dig a hole. He'll never realize that he's digging his own hole by accepting these invitations. By being warm and close to Esther. He's feeling on top of the world. So Esther places his ego against his paranoia. His ego is being built up and he doesn't realize shaita. Don't get too big because you're making somebody jealous. You're making your king jealous. Be humble. But this is his own weakness. An egotistical person, when you feed it and you elevate it, it's very hard to resist, even if you're very smart. This is what Esther does. She feeds ego against paranoia. Now look what happens next. They come to the second feast. (laughs) They come to the second feast. And what happens at the second feast? Achashverosh didn't have a moment of sleep. All night he was thinking what's going on. 
In the meantime, something else happened beyond Esther's imagination of Mordechai being rewarded. And suddenly the king feeling very good about Mordechai, which couldn't hurt the situation. But this explains what the Maharil writes. Rabbi Yaakov Mullen, the famous Maharil of the 15th century, writes, that, but the, and the, that's the minig most communities. But where do you raise the voice by the Megillah? By Laila Ahu Nada Dashna Samelech. Why? So the Maharil says, because Toik Vaishalnais, that's where the nest begins. To the point that Rashbi says, the shit of Rashbi, Megillah, Daf Yatasam and Aleph, that you could be Yoitz of the Megillah from Balaila Ahu Nada, though you don't have to read before. It's not the halacha. The halacha is like Rabbi Mary, you have to read the whole Megillah. But that's the shit of Rashbi. Why is Balaila Ahu Nada the miracle? We said before, that's not really the miracle. The miracle was Esther and Achashverish, because even Alpi Pshat, the sleepless night of Achashverish, that was it. That's it, Esther needed. She needed, her husband should lose a night of sleep. The next meal, he was already, he was already psychologically tense, and now he was noticing every single nuance. And now, when her husband turns to her and says, What do you want, Esther Hamalke? Tell me, was willst du? Esther knows this is the moment. This is the moment. And when she tells her husband, So the Malbim says, what's the difference between She'ela and Bakasha? Why the redundancy? We say, I'll come over to you and say, I want to ask you for something. I want a Bakasha. What's the difference? Sha'ela means you ask for something, but it's not necessarily what you really want. Bakasha is your ultimate agenda, your ultimate objective. Sometimes I ask you for something, right? But I don't tell you what I really want. I say, maybe you're going here, maybe you're doing this, maybe... What do you really want? Hashem. We ask for things. For my own soul, I ask... For my people, I have a bakasha. Don't think I'm using my people to save myself. You don't even know I'm Jewish. Of course I want to be saved. But va'ami bevakashasi. Because ultimately I will remain the tragic person in the story. I'm going to remain in your palace. Va'ami bevakashasi. My bakasha, my ultimate agenda is my people. Kinim karnu ani v'yami lashmid lahare golabit. So Hashvedr says, Mi Who is the man who wants to murder you? I felt, I felt there was something going on. Tell me who wants to murder you. Esther points to the man and he, she says, Ish tsarva oyev homon haraza. And then, and then, her strategy couldn't work better. Because Haman, noifelo amite, he falls down on the bed to plead for his life with Esther. And when Hashverish comes back from the garden after he had a cigarette, he comes in and what does he see? Haman is on the bed. Whoa! Hagam lichboishas hamalke imi baboyis for nine years. For nine years. You've been draining me a cup. You're conquering my queen in my house. You're my great protector. You're my great savior. You're my greatest loyal subject. You're my closest aide. You're protecting me from the state's enemies. And my own queen, the closest thing to me, you came in between us. When, when, when Esther sees this happen, this is the moment. And then, of course, there's always Harvoina who says, there's a beautiful tree out there. Why don't we use it for Haman? And Esther accomplishes her feat. There's a Gemara in Sanhedrin, I think Kovav. The Gemara says the worst thing you can do in the world is get in between a lion and a lioness during intimacy. It's a Gemara in Sanhedrin. You don't want to do that. Don't get in between a lion and a lioness during intimacy. Esther made sure that she took Haman and she put him in between the lion and the lioness during intimate moments. Haman allowed himself to go there because of his ego. Achashverish's greatest paranoia was now turned around against Haman. This transformed the situation. Now, now, take a look at a Gemara in Megillah, and you'll see the whole Shear in the Gemara's words. 
even though a little bit in different words. And then finally, we're going to do the last shtikl, how it's reflected in the words of the Arizal. Zagdi Gemara Megillah Daf Tesvava Medbeis Toner Abana. This is the last of the second source. Toner Abana. Ma Ra Se Esther Shazimnes Haman. Why did Esther invite Haman to the party? What's the question? I think the question is Mordechai said, "Speak to your husband." So why didn't she just go speak to him? Why the need for the party? The Gemara is not asking about the two parties. The Gemara is just asking about even the first party. So now goes, very interestingly, a whole list of opinions. She prepared a trap for him because food is good to prepare traps. She learned from her childhood, when your enemy is hungry, give him bread. Again, during meals, people become vulnerable. Reb Meir says, Pashat. Haman is far away from the palace. He hears what's happening. And what is he going to do? He's going to stage a mutiny against the Hashverish. How right was Reb Meir? Barrier hurt. Stalin is going to kill him. What did Barrier do? He killed Stalin. That's what Reb Meir says. Ahasuerus will stage a mutiny. He has enough support. He'll get, he'll get everyone, everyone works for Haman. He'll get the bodyguards to kill Haman. What's the, to kill Hashverish. So that's why she had to have Haman right there on the spot. So that he, he could be finished off. Nobody should know she's Jewish. Because if they know, if the Hashverish knows she's Jewish, so then she becomes part of the enemy. She is the enemy. By inviting Haman, who is a shtickle Hitler, to the party, no one, a Jew does this. Haman just issued forth a decree to kill every Jew. You invite him to the party? That means you're part of the SS. You want Haman to be there. You're not a Jew. So this allows Esther now to feed Achashverosh's paranoia. Reb Nechem Yoimer, Kadei Shelo Yoimru Yisrael Achois Yeshlonu Beveis HaMelech V'yosichu Daitem in Arachemim. Extraordinary. She was afraid the Jews will say, we have a sister in the palace. We don't need a Reboi Nishaloyla. We have the first lady, Mrs. Achashverosh. She'll solve the problem. Suddenly the Yidin see, a Yiddish Amedel, who does she invite? Who does she invite? It was the front page of all the Jewish websites. She invites Homan to the party. We can't rely on her. We're going to Davin. All we can rely is on God. That's what she needed. The Maharal writes in Ur Chadash. The Maharal has a Pirush on Megillah called Ur Chadash. He says, Esther understood the situation is so desperate that if they rely on humanity, the great events won't be able to happen. She needed, they should give up on her. Let her do her job. Let her do her job. No one knows. Nobody knows. And let Hashem do His job. And she'll be His shliach in her, in her own private way. This also takes a lot of Mesir Nefesh. Weiter. Rabbi Yossi Yoimek, Deshi Yemotzullah B'chalais. Rabbi Yossi says she wanted Hama to be around constantly. She'll see a moment. She'll be able to play this against this. She'll be able to get rid of... She wanted him there. Rabbi Shem Bebenas Yoimer, Ula Yargish HaMokim V'yasalonu Neis. This is a Pella. Maybe the Rabbi Nishalaylam will finally feel what's going on and they will do a miracle. What's pshat? It's not enough. But all the Jews are going to be destroyed. That's not enough. But when Hashem sees that I, a Jewish girl, a Beis Yaakov graduate, has to sit with Haman at a meal, finally Hashem will say, you know, this is pretty disgusting. It's hard to understand them. If Hashem say, we'll see in a moment, pshat. Maybe Hashem will feel, maybe now, he'll, so to speak in English, you would say, he'll get it. He'll finally feel the Asalon Unes. Yabishua ben Karchaimer. Yabishua ben Karcha says, Asbir loy ponim, kadeshi yahari huvihi. You know what I'll do? I'll show such a beautiful face to Haman. Achashverish will think we're having, we're, we're, we're cheating on him. He'll kill me. He'll kill him. Rashi says the law is that the minister who is responsible for a decree, if he's killed, the decree gets nullified. I will die. Haman will die and the people will live. That's what, that's what Esther was stranded. That may happen. Achashverish, the paranoid one, will decide we're having a relationship. He'll kill both of us, but the Jews will be saved. Rebbe Gamliel says the man was so indecisive. He had no position that he took seriously. He would always change himself. Esther thought he'll say no decree. And then Haman will come in an hour later and change his mind. So she had to change everything on the spot because she knew this guy is turning around. He's completely indecisive. 
All these explanations are insufficient. We still need the view of Rebbe Lezah Amudoy. The Tanya Rebbe Lezah Amudoy Yoymer. All these views are not enough. You want to hear what Rebbe Lezah Amudoy said? Kinatoi b'melech, kinatoi b'sorim. She made the king jealous of Haman and she made all the sorim jealous of Haman. What she needed to do is look at Haman and say, this man is no good Nick. This man I am envious of. This man is a threat. Kinasoi b'melech. She generated kina, zealousness, jealousy in the king towards him and the Sodom. How? By making him so prominent. This Rabbi Gabriel says we need. Rabbi Omar Lufnei Shever Gon. Rabbi says, it's a Apostle says, before you break, you got to lift up. Abaya and Rav, Amri Travayu, Abaya and Rav both say, Bechoyimim Oshis es Mishteyim Vegoyimim. Rishoyim, before I defeat them, I first warm them up a drink. And that's what Esther did. Ashkechei Rabbi Baravu Ale Eliyahu. Rabbi Baravu meets Eliyahu on Avi. Amale, he says, I want to ask a question. Keman Chazia Esther Va'avda Hachi. Who does Esther agree with? When Esther did this, who was, who was she thinking? Like, which one? Amale, Eliyahu said, Kechulu Tanoi, O Kechulu Amairoi. Esther Hamalka was entertaining the ideas of every single one of these Tanaim and every single one of these Amirayim. What's Pshat? What's Pshat? Why did she do it? Pshat is she knew her husband. She knew Haman. This was her strategy. This is how she fed his ego against his paranoia, according to all different views and opinions. And victory, by Yehudim Aysayah, victory was achieved. Now... There is that one last Vartin Gemara that we have to understand. Maybe the Rebbeinu Shalom will feel what's going on and will make a miracle. Of course, she doesn't mean that Hashem would find out what's going on. She says, Yargish, there'll be a Hergish. What's the Havana? So let's see the last shtickle here, which will explain the words of the Arizal. Yavoy HaMelech V'Haman Hayoy. And this is from Torah Eir, Megillus Esther, Tavtsad the Gimel Amedalet from the Baal HaTanya. We have to understand Esther behaves completely not according to the advice of Mordechai. And Mordechai is the Rosh Sanhedrin. You're not, allowed to, you're not allowed to disobey the head of the Sanhedrin. Forget that he was uh, her relative, maybe even her husband according to, to the Chazal. And she makes a feast twice. Rachel, the woman, he means Rachel, the woman, is that Keres Abayis. She runs the world, she runs the house, not Mordechai. In other words, when it comes to implementing something in the world, Esther is the expert. Her husband Mordechai is Yisoyed Abba, which in Kabbalah means Abba is Chachma, a very high, aloof level. And he's the Yisoyed of Chachma. Mordechai is the spiritual leader, the visionary. But the one who's the Akeris Habayis, the one who implements things in the world, that's Rachel, that's Esther. And Mordechai, Botach Balev Baila, he trusts her. He has Betachin. She knows how to run the show. He gives her the vision, and she knows how to get it done. So she makes on her own a suda twice without Mordechai's consent. What does she do? Her strategy is she lifts Haman and she... Okay. She lifts up Haman and she brings him too much close to Gdusha. And here, of course, he's shifting from the Nigla to the Nister, from Pshat to Sod. According to the Chachmei Hanister, the Chachmei Hadrush, from the Ramah to the Maharal to the Arizal to the Chachmei Achsidus, the Megillah is also a metaphor. Esther represents Knesset Yisrael, the Anoichi Aster Aster, a state of concealment. Achashveresh represents Akadish Baruch Hu, Achariz Vereshus Shaloi. Haman represents unholiness, evil, negativity, clip. What's her strategy? She takes Haman and she brings him too close to Achashveresh. Too close to Kedusha, too close to the Melech, too close to Hashem. B'meila, v'oz ha'isam ha'palosoy me'elav. 
And then he has an automatic defeat. You know why? Ki haklipa loy tuchal kabel chayes v'yenika liyos yesh v'davar b'fnei atzmoi ela kushu meruchok me hakdusha v'chol shmashul yoyser kare v'lagdusha mizbatel me elov ki himas doinag mipnei esh. You know when you put some margarine, margarine or butter in a frying pan or wax, and you put on the fire, it just melts away. What's the koyach of, of klipa? The gavaldik of the Balatanya says. The koyach of Haman is that it's distant from Kedusha. And because it's distant from Kedusha, it can create a separate delusional world for itself. You can create a world of lies only when the truth is not shining on you. And we all do this. How do people create webs of lies? Because they live in their own world. Addicts do this all the time. People who are in addiction. They create a brilliant web of lies to themselves. Not only, of course, to others, but to themselves. Because they never allow the light of truth to shine on them. And therefore, I'm not accountable to truth. I'm not sensitive to truth. I'm not a student of truth. And whenever you have somebody whose life is based on a cover-up, that's what's called klipa. The word klipa means a shell, a husk. Why do the Mechabalim call unholiness a husk? You have the husk of a banana, the peel of a banana, of an orange. Why a husk? The answer is because klipa is based on the fact that there's a cover-up, there's a husk. And because there's a cover-up of reality, therefore I can exist. And if you're going to expose the fact that there's a cover-up and you're going to show truth, I'll cease to exist. Because what's the kayach of klipa? The kayach of klipa is always denying truth. And the more it can cover up truth, the more it has power. Every addiction in the world, every unhealthy, immoral craving in the world, what's its koyach? Its koyach is, it comes to you, it entices you to do something, and then you say to it, let me analyze you, let me dissect you, let me ask a few experts if it's worthwhile. And every addiction, every craving will say, no, 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 now. You have to do it now, now, now. The koyach taiv is always about now. Why? Because if we're going to think about it, if we're going to analyze it, if we're going to figure out the benefits and the losses, it's going to lose its power. And its whole power is klipa. Its whole power is covering up the truth. The more you cover up the truth, the more it can exist. The less you cover up the truth, the less it can exist. Many regimes, many empires, all based on klipa, cover up. The communist regime, how did it collapse? Not through bloodshed. Light was shined on it. Suddenly after 70 years, people realized the whole thing is rotten. It's eroded at its core. And, and it just, it, fall, it falls away on its own. Zakt, zakt balatanya. You know what Esther did? She took Klippa and she brought it too close to Kedusha. And when Kedusha shines, when there's truth, there's no cover up. So suddenly its whole very identity dissipates. It ceases to exist. And I'll tell you even further, the Oyer HaMeyer, the Sefer Oyer HaMeyer, by the B'zei Wolf of Zhitomir, Ukraine, he was a student of the Baal Shem Tev. He writes in the Megillah, a vart from the Baal Shem Tev, a half vart, which fits into this very gishmak. Why does the Megillah begin with the story of Vashti being summoned and being executed? Why is that relevant to the story? L'chayre, the main part of the story is that Vashti was killed and Esther was brought in as a king. Who cares how she was killed? So we understand al Pipshat that that story of the party tells us Achashverosh's personality and Haman's personality and therefore we can understand how everything developed. But the Baal Shem Tev says something else. He says, the Gemara says in Megillah, Daf Yud Gimel, I think, that Achashverosh asked Vashti to come without clothes. Vatemain, she refused. So he explains as follows. Achashverosh is a metaphor for Hashem. Vashti is a metaphor for Klippa. Vashti is shtei duality. It's not Hashem Echa, duality. Every person has a time in life when the king of kings summons you to approach him. But there's one condition. The condition is you have to come without clothes. You have to come exposed fully. Vashti represents klippa. Klippa can't come without clothes. You know why? The definition of klippa is a cover-up, clothes. So when you summon Vashti and you say, come without your garments, come without your clothes, you know what happens? She ceases to exist. She doesn't even have to be killed. She just ceases to exist. She ceases. Imagine if I have a yeshiva or, or a moisid or an institution or a business, and it's not legit. 
Nothing, nothing is legal over there. Now somebody comes for an inspection and says, could you show me your books? I say, no way. I'm never showing you my books. Because if I show you my books, you're going to see how corrupt it is. You're going to close it down. But what if I am completely legit and you want to come see my books? I say, Pajalista, come see my books. Come look at everything. I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to hide. Kedusha never has to hide anything. Why are you hiding? You hide, you cover up when you have what to cover up. When you don't have what to cover up, you don't have to hide. They say the difference between a mitzvah and an aver is, both of them have an ah, and both of them have an oi. The question is timing. By a mitzvah, first it's oi, I'm not in the mood. But after you do it, ah, it feels good. By an aver, in the beginning, it's ah, I'm a chayy, this is going to be lovely. But later, later it never feels good. Later you have the oi. So Klippa always speaks in the name of immediate gratification. It looks good, it sounds good, it feels good. But it's not good. It's a cover-up, it's Klippa. You tell Vashti, take off your clothes. So you know the famous story, the emperor has no clothes. Here the story is, the clothes have no emperor. Klippa is clothes without an emperor. So now when Esther, Esther takes Haman and puts him under the light, skeletons, demons, ghosts, where do they all hang out? In the darkness. When light comes, they're not there. You know why they're not there? Because they were never there. Their entire existence came from the fact that they were lying. They were denying reality. That's the Kayach HaKlippah. What's the greatest lie in the world? The greatest lie in the world is that Hashem is not right here, right with me at this moment in every situation. That's the greatest lie. The lie that I'm unholy, I'm ungodly, I'm detached from Hashem. That's the greatest lie. That's Klippah. Every instinct that you have, every thought, word, action that you do, that is based on the notion that you're not holy, you're not godly, you're not part of infinity, that's Klippah. you typhus, hey. Any instinct that says you're part of Hashem, you're part of infinity, you're holy, you're great, you're good, you're a reflection of the Ein Saif, that's called Kedusha. What does Esther do? She takes Haman. She doesn't destroy him. She lifts him up. She lifts him up to the world of Achashverosh a little too high. What happens? The light is exposed. When the light is exposed, you see Einoid Mulvadoi. So now the Yesh, the Yesh just dissipates. Like Kihimas Doinad. It's like wax in the frying pan. You don't have to fight with the wax. It just melts away. So now he goes, she goes right. Velachain, therefore, kirves haman betachlis hakiru v'loishivu besudas hamelech v'amalk. That's why she was mekarev haman betachlis hakiru. She knew the way to deal with it was not to denigrate haman. It was to be mekarev haman with the ultimate kiru. She had to make him as close as possible to her, and as close as possible to the stature and status of the king which would make the king on a literal level furious, and on a spiritual level, on a godly level, it would allow Haman to, to lose himself. Kemayim Razal, this is what Chazal say, he's referring here to a Zoyar in Parshas Veschanan, but it's based on the Gemara in Sanhedrin, I told you before, Kad When a lion and a lioness are together, Woe to the one who goes through them. Woe to the one who interrupts between the lion and the lioness. When she saw after the first meal that he's still a yesh, his ego is intact, he's fully powerful, the king is good with him, alts is good. She makes a second meal, and at this stage, of course, the face of Haman is down, dejected. This is the pshat. Let the king and Haman come today. The Gemara says at the end of Megillah, when they go to Bavel or Persia, the Shechina comes with them. So therefore you have Hashem's name, Yudke Vavke, and the Shechina was there in Galos. The Esther Yakeres Habayis Bigdushal Pipashit. But you understand that Esther, she was the Akeres Habayis of Kedusha. By clip it says it has no hope. We say, So he says, what's tikva? Tikva is tik vav hey. Tik vinartik levav hey. Lahafrid mi yud hey. Tikva, tik means a, uh, a tik, a, uh, a bag, a cover, a cover. 
around Tikva, around Vav Hey. The Rabbi Nishalem, there's four letters. There's Yud Hey and there's Vav Hey. Generally, Yud and Hey represent revelations of godliness that transcend the universe. Vav and Hey, Hanistoris Lashem Alekeinu, Vihan Niglois, Vav Hey. That which comes down, which is expressed in the world, the pchin of, of Elohim, Begematria, Teva, and so forth. Yudke are higher levels of godliness that are beyond us, and Vavke are revelations of godliness that imbue the world. Yavoy Hamelech Vahamon Hayoim is Yud and K and Vav and K. What does Esther do? She brings Haman into the space between Yud and He, and the final He. The final He is the Shechina. The final He is Esther. The final He is Knesset Yisrael, Akeris Habayis, the souls of Israel. What's her strategy? Bring Haman between the lion and the lioness. Bring Haman between Yud and He, and the last He. That's why Yavoy HaMelech is Yud and He. The Haman is the Vav. Hayoim is the last He. And Haman comes in between Hashem and the Jewish people between Achashverosh and Esther, between the lion and the lioness. When that happens, clip is too close. It's too much under the gaze of truth. It now interrupts the intimate relationship. Haman automatically falls. So that's what the Gemara says. Yargish nes. Of course Hashem knew what happened. But when this happens, when Haman is elevated to the point that he's now interrupting between the king and Esther Hamalka, so on a pshat level, he's furious. On a mystical, on a spiritual level, when Klippa becomes so elevated, now it's Yeshus has no toikif. Yargish hamakoim, how elevated Haman is. V'yasalonunes. He says, V'hi kirves Haman kol kach achen is batal me'elov. She brought him so high until he was automatically nullified. V'nishar tziruf havaya. So what's left is, you have the tziruf of havaya, you have the tziruf, the combination of Hashem, Without Haman, and thus Esther creates La Yehudim Oisa'ir of Asimcha Vesasim Vikar, Kain Tiyalanu. Thank you. Have a wonderful week on Afrelech and Purim. In Mitzah Hashem, next week we will have the Shear here, Sunday, 9.30 a.m. Thank you. Story from Hura. Hura. Yeah. Uh, 1953. Yeah, the Rebbe was the same. 1953. Thank you for the sources. You got it, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Shalom Aleichem. I see you here for the second time. I'm using another shear this time. Colorado is not warm enough. Oh, okay. Let's make it. That's according to Op Shot. I know, so how does that fit into uh No, I was just trying to show how Esther what, what Esther's strategy is. Yeah, Esther herself, yeah, but she didn't see the name in her own situation. What should she do? The whole thing of wine has to end up Kakaola, if you said Sanhadri. Yeah, but then afterwards they have to say to me say Kashara Vadati or Vadati. Right. So I mean so Well, the the more that I told you, me a day in my East Kazois, he got the mouth, yes. But in Golos, the Seder is Ein Saim Chinalanas. And you have to work with Dark Eatem. And that's why Mordechai told, told her to go to Achashverosh. You can't just say, uh, you know, there'll be a Ness. <laughs> no. was, you know, the Mordechai says, why don't we say Halal on Purim? Because Akata Avdad Achashverosh. The Seder of Golos. Your Bernish Lenin runs the world, but he runs it through, through the mechanisms of nature. And, and that's, that's part of the tragedy of Golos.
It's it's a gullible story, but 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 that's true for Esther. Was not for Esther, and yet her son goes and is allows the rebuilding of the second day Hamikdash. So the Hashgacha put her in in, in in difficult places. You too. Your son too. Very good. Very nice to see you. Atzlach Harav. Yeah, yeah, very good. You're saying if she would have asked for the Jewish people, it's more than Chatzia Malchus. He's giving up his whole Malchus. He was so paranoid. Very good. Shakaya. It's more than Chatzia Malchus. It's giving up everything. You want me to die. You want me to die. A revolt against me. Very good. Thank you. It's time for giving. Yeah. But I can't miss the sheet because this sheet is like the gas for my week. And I came in and then I couldn't fall asleep. You might be a, you played my ego. <laughs> I played your ego against your yeah, uh, against my will. need to sleep. Yeah. yeah. And I couldn't wow. okay. When is it going to be? Go ahead, go ahead. When is it going to be in the way? I got to have this question before you answer anything else. I got to show you. Please, Mazik, it's not for Zayn Hamad. Just go ahead. She's talking to you. Hashverin. She says, Hashverin, she says, Loy. Loy. I love Thoth. Right. And then, Mishnah, she's talking to both. I'm not Muhammad. I said, Lohem. Right. So the answer is, I think, because the way to speak to a king with respect was in third person. You don't say, like in Yiddish, there's a difference between do and ear, or eich, yeah. Eich really is plural, but it's also singular when it's a certain element of respect. So you don't say, I did to you, Asha Sisi Law. For M, or you, you, like you'll say, uh, can I ask the Rosh Hashiva a question? Not can I ask you, a, like if I want to ask him, I say, can I ask the Rosh Hashiva a question? So, uh, so, uh, so that's what she means. We, same thing. Oh, a sissy is because she wanted. She already prepared. Yeah, yeah, let's go right now. Yeah. No, this is Hagim, Alasha Sisi Loi, and Pasakhas Asha Esse Lohem. So the Diuk is Loi and Lohem. Who says this? The Mittler Rebbe, the son of the Balatanya. Loi and Lohem, that's where I saw it. He has a Maimet Tofkov Pe Gimel Purim, 1823. You Typhus? You Typhus? I don't know if I read a little detail, but most of it. A friend of him put it in. What is Machta? Why did it say, my Hudim? Simcha. <laughs> Why did it say like Moy Sorry was simple? Why did it say like Yudimoy so tiny? Yeah. No end fair. Ah, flex good. No. No, I don't know. Who stayed of Miller? So the Sfas Emes asks you, Shaila, why doesn't it say like Yehudim Ha'isa Torah, the Yom Tif, and this? 
Und er sagt ein Wort. Das Wort ist, was er das Wort ist, dass um, das will die Megillah sagen. Die Megillah wants to say, dass Purim, die Jeden were Teufels, die Jeden were Margisch, dass was ist eure? Was ist Pshat, dass Lichtigkeit in Leib so teure? Und was ist Pshat, dass sie Simche in Leib so teure? Was ist das, dass sie so teure sind? Der Wort ist Purim, der der Herd. What's pshat a lichte kelebin? What's pshat a freilich kelebin? Zutayr is a yamtiv. Chayr elu tefillin is also because the parshi is some achusas. No, it's still chav. Besides, actually, in the times. Say that's next. Well, the first question. I know. I heard all the tirutzim. But why? I'll chav b'shayv. 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 Tefillin is l'shayv. Right. Fine. Because shloyo shliyat. Yeah. That's the Ramban and the boy. But I'll chav b'shayv. The the this is the question everyone asks. Like the most sorry, this question for the service. Yeah. I'll have the cash because what like the most sorry. It's quite sorry. The the kumra chef at Zurich. He had some more chalif lamel, but was malchut. He stayed there. He was kodesh came back. The whole the whole the issues of service of mechutz. He went up at the the beginning of the galus was so stark. Right. So the 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 going right. The oysters is is rumors and all the what's called and the 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 oysters was so stark in the brio. Right. It was the beginning of the Zurich oil to Tyro. Right, and, and if you look at that post of shot, right, so they ask, well, how does Rashi know God's own belief? So they say, in Yerav, and uh, the Bozo post of the epistle, like, Pashot Zemoch, and Vatzati Mimoch, and Shumazo, and Shumazo, and Shumazo, and Shumazo, and Bach, and Shumazo, 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 Say, pause up shot. Pause up shot. Okay. Well, what's the main to film? What's the Vico? The Vico. Vico, Elut to We're all coming out, it's not. Right. Well, what's the pause? The Yoke of Nayid. What's the Vico? Vico is the most in Miyake. Glory, glory. So, the film is. Stalik, you cut it, the Kutchabrik, you cover it. Loshin, Loshin, and Loshin, and Gemorit, and Dalwin Base. Das ist wie ein Nezem. Nezem oder Rösch. Nezem oder Rösch. Peir. Aber da heißt der Wort. The miracle of Purim. Es ist mit der Knecke mit. Ich habe nicht mehr gesagt, aber ich habe das. Ich habe keine Patient. ADD. ADHD. ADHD. Ja, ich habe das. 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 Und ich habe das. 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 Ich I thought I was super. I was like, "Oh my God!" I thought I was like, "Oh my God!" I thought I was super. Oh my God! Oh my God! I was like, "Oh my God!" I'm in the base, yeah. I thought I was like, "Oh my God!" I'm in the base, yeah. But the nekude is the chmida connected mida. What was the gzeir? The gzeir is the nenu mesadasa shulai sir dasha. What was the tanya on that? So what's the diuk nenu? Achlo. What's the nenu? The tanya says that the achlo is a kfiyo that it enjoyed it. Oh, chavos chayim. Yeah, yeah. What's much? What's much? Just much just to the bane. Right. What's much just to? What are you? Right, but I said, I said, Rizik. I said that they did two things over here, because mitzad echod shleitoch and rishonim that they also nena on Shabbos. So the chisor from the chisor of Klai Yisrael was the nena. So I said like this: Gemara Shabbos Kufit Ches Bei says Omar Bidon Marav Chomalik. So Shabbos Tosh Shabbos Shalsi B'Shem Shalsi B'Shem. That's Gemara Omeral. The Omer Bei is Gemara says Meitom Shalsi B'Shem Shalsi B'Shem. Meitom Shalsi B'Shem Shalsi B'Shem. Meitom Shalsi B'Shem I said on Shabbos, what was Zal Gal Hashem? So Shom fang tzichan, the guest, the guest, the Muslim, the guest, the Hashem, the Briyeh, the Zal Gal Hashem. I said, "Pshat, for any two Esther pieces, we stay there. We can't eat with the goy. I can't eat with the goy. Pshat, for Esther zach, we're too gishtol to the sibas, the sibas achilah. Shabbos, the pshat is when I eat. The only Shabbos, right? As I'm too gishtol to the sibas, the Eibush zok zayim ma'anig of Shabbos. And the name of the Shlosh is Hashem. They're doing two things. They also have to be messaged themselves and be stuck to the boy in the shloyel. And they have to be soft to the shloyel. It's like we have to be able to do it. My mother, my mother, my mother. My mother, my mother. My mother, my mother. My mother, my mother. Yeah, exactly. So because it was nenu, so by them the tfisa was, that teva, that was the ikka of the shloyel. Right, 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 right. So what was the nes? Not that it was teira. As in the head, what's the shat oire in Leben? What's the simcha in Leben? Was ist Simche? Das ist Teure. Das ist Schabrus. Ich habe es mal lernen von Dweikus, wie steht doch in der Schein. Wenn man lernt, ist ein Dorfug. Es kommt bereit, ich bin im Chadus. Ich habe es als Soja. Es tut 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 Soja.
For the Jewish people, he was elevated from a name to the Atom. The Godel Merav and Shmoy. The closer you are, you don't need the only. And here it's even beyond Shmoy. You don't even have to say as well. Yeah, yeah. Kultovatzlocha. Thank you. 
I'm not going to take me to the entire for complimenting you. I wish I had like ten, ten pages of notes. Uh, oh, wow. Or okay. more. Oh, wow. <laughs> thank you, thank so, you. The Kimu Kibble. The, the, the Gras the gra Safer. The Gras Safer, Kimu the Kibble. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I read Rev the Rights on, on the Gras. You know Rev the Safer? Yeah, yeah. Kimu the Kibble. I'm putting it. Right, it's Mamashin. Right, right. Yeah. Atas Hashem. Yeah. It's Mamashin. Simul the Sigma. It's beautiful. Thank you. Pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, you remind me the of the topic of Pasha's About the Badr, the Poles. He spoke to the Tziv. They were Badr. Thank you. You can go listen to it. I said, yeah, but you could listen to it if you want. <laughs> so I guess...